Thank you very much. And uh, the, ti the change in title means very little. It's essentially the same talk, but I did put a, a little bit more in it, and so perhaps a slightly less uh, meaningful title uh, fits better. Anyway, so uh, yes, I'm now at the University of St. Andrews, and uh, I thought I'd show you a picture of this beautiful place where I work now, and uh, maybe encourage you to come and visit there sometime. It, uh, it really is very nice. Um, so, uh, I'm going to spend s part of my time on telling you or reminding you in many cases, because there are people here who know at least as much about uh, this stuff as I do, about uh, what two graphs are. This was a, a very interesting development that began in the 1960s, and uh, uh, I, in my view, it's not completely played out yet. There's more to learn about these things. And uh, then I will tell you some recent results, certainly not all of them mine, uh, about uh, two graphs. So, um, that's a picture of an icosahedron that I nicked from somewhere on the web. It's not a terribly good picture, but you've seen an icosahedron before. You know what it looks like. 20 triangular faces, and in particular it has 12 vertices. Uh, they come in six antipodal pairs, so there are six diagonals joining them. And because of the symmetry, any two of those six diagonals make the same angle. If you imagine holding the icosahedron up by two vertices, if you look down from above, you will see five lines going down, the angle between the vertical line and each of those five will be the same, and you can use any diagonal as the vertical line, so all those angles are equal. So it's a set of six equiangular lines in three-dimensional space. That's the greatest number of equiangular lines that you can squeeze into three-dimensional space, and it's a nice configuration. Um, but uh, there, it ha it's not just geometric, it has combinatorial structure, too. Um, the, uh, uh, any two diagonals are just two lines intersecting at a certain fixed angle, so any pair of things are the same. But when you start looking at triples of diagonals, you see there's a difference. If you hold the uh, figure up by a face, look down on a face, the three edges coming out uh, the three diagonals passing through those, any two of them make an acute angle. But if you take another line like that, further round from this vertex, those three cannot be, uh, uh, you c those diagonals cannot, you can't choose the directions along them so that all the angles are acute. So there are two different kinds of triples going on there. So the combinatorial structure is to do with triples rather than pairs. And the uh, rotation group of the icosahedron, which of course is uh, the alternating group A5, permutes these six diagonals. This gives the two transitive action of A5 on six things, acting as PSL25. Uh, it's two transitive, it is not three transitive, because it's preserving these two types of triples, the ones that can be, that make acute angles and the ones that cannot make, all make acute angles. So, uh, preserving that combinatorial structure. And that's, in essence, what a two-graph is. So, um, around 1970, Graham Higman, this was in the days which uh, some of you are not old enough to remember, when uh, sporadic finite simple groups were being discovered, were popping up all over the place, seemingly. And uh, I remember on one occasion, I was uh, walking around the streets of London, and I saw a van go past, and on the side of it, it said in big letters, the Cameron Group, and underneath was a seven-digit number. <laughs> Unfortunately, it was an odd number. <laughs> I don't know whether it was a prime or not. <laughs> But um, um, uh, one of the people who began this uh, gold rush was John Conway, who discovered three new simple groups um, from the Leech lattice. 
Graham Hickman was giving an alternative construction of the third Conway group, which in fact has the remarkable property that it has a doubly transitive action on 276 points. And apart from the Mathieu groups, only one other sporadic simple group has a doubly transitive action, that's the Higman-Sims group, uh, which Graham Higman also had a hand in, although the Higman in the name Higman-Sims was Donald Higman. So, uh, but anyway, uh, so Graham Hickman was constructing Conway 3 as a doubly transitive permutation group on 276 points, and he did it by constructing a combinatorial structure on which it acts. And this combinatorial constructure was a set of triples taken from a set of 276 points uh, and showed that the automorphism group of this set of triples was a finite simple group and identified it with uh, Conway 3. So the set of triples that Higman used had the property that if you take any four points, within that set of four you will see an even number of triples. Maybe they're all of the four possible three sets are triples, maybe two of the four, maybe none, but an even number. So that was the sort of characteristic property and he called such a set a two graph. And uh, I know hypergraph theorists hate this because they think it's a three graph, but <laughs> I'll explain to you why it's a two graph in a couple of slides time. Uh, so Higman called such a set a set of triples with the property that any four set contain an even number of distinguished triples. That's a two graph. And uh, just like the icosahedron with the six uh, diagonals, there's a set of 276 equiangular lines in 23-dimensional space uh, realized inside the Leech lattice, and that's how you identify it with the Conway group in the end. Uh, but there is a set of 276 equiangular lines, and the triples of the two graph can be taken to be the ones where the lines can be switched, can be directed to make ac acute angles. Uh, so, in fact, in a sense, it was that that got me a, my first job, my first uh, postdoc. Uh, this was a uh, junior research fellowship in Oxford, open to all subjects, and so the committee sitting around the table was made up of chemists and historians and philosophers and all kinds of people, and the interviewer asked me about what was in my PhD thesis, but then was kind enough to say, well, I've heard you talking about these uh, equiangular lines in 23-dimensional space. Could you tell us about that? So I held forth about stuff in 23-dimensional space, and I think the historians and philosophers were so blown away by that that they gave me the job. <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, Higman wasn't the first person that had come to similar ideas. Uh, that was Yap Seidel, and I'd like to... Uh, uh, give credit to him for setting up a lot of this stuff. Uh, he was looking at sets of equiangular lines uh, in questions arising from something called the congruence order of elliptic space, and in particular the elliptic plane. I won't tell you what that is, but that's what his thesis was on, and it led him to study sets of equiangular lines. He didn't represent them in the way Higman did, he chose instead something called a switching class of graphs, which I'll explain to you. Uh, if you take a graph on a given set of vertices, what do I mean by switching it? You divide the vertices up into two classes, and every edge that goes between the two classes changes to a non-edge. Every non-edge changes to an edge, but within each class, the edges and non-edges remain exactly as they were. I think I drew a picture. Yes, there's a graph, and red doesn't show up well in this system, but these two are supposed to be red. So I'm going to switch with respect to that set. That means this will become a non-edge, that will become a non-edge, but the two diagonals will become edges, and we'll get that. So that's the operation of switching. And it's fairly easy to see that if you switch a graph with respect to a set and then with respect to another set, the overall result is just switching with respect to the symmetric difference of those two sets. 
So switching is an equivalence relation on graphs, and the equivalence classes are called switching classes. So uh, Seidel represented equiangular lines by switching classes of graphs in a way that I'll show you in a moment. But I just thought I'd first show you, uh, Yap Seidel died in uh, 2001. They planted a tree for him on the campus in uh, Eindhoven. Uh, that's the tree, and you see there a pillar with this plaque on it. So that's the Seidel tree in Eindhoven. So, the following things are equivalent. Two graphs, which I've defined to you in Higman's sense, switching classes of graphs, double covers of complete graphs, we'll come to that, and sets of equiangular lines in Euclidean space. Uh, and I'll show you how all these equivalences work. Uh, but in particular, Seidel publicized this theory very much, and uh, when he learned about Higman's work, he visited Oxford a couple of times in the late 60s and early 70s, and uh, enthusiastically took up the idea of a two-graph, and wrote several surveys about them. Uh, there was a lot of very interesting mathematics that went on in those days, partly connected with finite simple groups, but partly connected with many other things as well. And in a sense, I suppose what I'm attempting to do here is continue what he was doing then and tell you about some interesting new work related to two graphs. So I want to briefly go through these equivalences. Two graphs and switching classes first. So, well, in a, so we've got an ordinary graph. Look at three vertices of that graph. Count the number of edges within that set of three vertices. Could be even, could be odd. So let's say an odd triple is a set of three vertices containing an odd number of edges. Then uh, a pair of graphs is equivalent under switching. You can switch one graph into another if and only if the odd triples in the first coincide precisely with the odd triples in the second. What you need for that is that when you do switch, you don't change the property of a triple of being odd. And that's just a case of drawing a few pictures of three vertex graphs and switching them and checking that odd goes to odd and even goes to even. Uh, and the set of odd triples in a graph is a two graph. Uh, if you t that this is essentially the handshaking lemma. If you take a set of four points and you count the edges, well, well, you, if you add up, if you count the incidences between edges and triples, you're just counting the edges twice, and that means the number of odd triples will have to be even, and so it's a two-graph. Every two-graph arises in this way, so there is a bijection between two-graphs and switching classes of graphs. And the consequence is that the automorphism group of the two-graph is the automorphism group of the switching class, which I haven't defined for you, so let me do it now. What's the automorphism of switching class? It's a permutation of the vertices that takes every graph in the switching class to another graph in the switching class. And I don't need to say every there. I can just say takes some graph in the, s in the switching class to another. That will be exactly the same because of this, uh, uh, well, you just write it down and see. And uh, therefore, this, the automorphism group of the switching class contains the automorphism group of each graph in the switching class as a subgroup. And uh, you can check for yourself, if you get bored with the talk, you can check for yourself that in the case of the uh, diagonals of the icosahedron, that's a switching class on six points. There are four, up to isomorphism, four graphs in the switching class. There is a pentagon with an isolated vertex, a pentagon with a vertex joined to everything. There is a triangle with three edges hanging off, and the complement of that, which I won't draw. But there are four graphs in the uh, switching class. And uh, just one interesting little thing here. This has been known for a while. Uh, every group is the automorphism group of some graph. Uh, but here's a refinement of Fruch's theorem. Given any finite group, there is a switching class of graphs with the properties that, 
the automorphism group of the switching class is G. That means the automorphism groups of the graphs in the switching class are subgroups. Every subgroup of G is the automorphism group of some graph in the switching class. And every subgroup of G includes G itself. So in fact, there is a graph in the switching class in this case that admits the whole of G. Uh, so you can simultaneously represent a group and all of its subgroups as the automorphism groups of the graphs in a switching class. Well, so here's the reason, and now I'm going to touch on the reason why Higman called them two graphs. Uh, so given a set of endpoints, we'll let VK be the vector space of functions from the set of K subsets of X to the field F2, the field uh, integers mod 2, right? Uh, now for any K less than N, there's a co-boundary map from VK to VK plus 1. So take F in VK, that's a function on the K subsets, we want to map it to a function on the k plus 1 subsets. So the value of that image function on a k plus 1 set, you just add up the values of f on all the k sets of subsets of the k plus 1 set. And it's easy to check that this is a co-boundary uh, with coefficients in the field f2 on the, n on the n minus 1 dimensional simplex. Uh, v naught has dimension 1 because all you can do is say, 0 or 1, when you map that into uh, uh, V1 by delta naught, you get the empty set, 0 everywhere, and the whole set, 1 everywhere, the all 0 and all 1 vectors. And that happens to be the kernel of delta 1. What If I go from delta 1 to delta 2, and that maps, uh, so a function uh, to work out the image on a, on a 2 set, you add up the values on an edge. Uh, the only time you'll get zero is when the values on the edge are the same. And so, in other words, the kernel of that is the all zero and all one vector. The image is the set of complete bipartite graphs because uh, you take a function on x, you'll get edges between a point with value zero and a point with value one, so that's a complete bipartite graph. The kernel of delta 2, you can check, I'll leave this one to you, is equal to the image of delta 1, and the image of delta 2 is the set of two graphs. Set of two graphs is the kernel of delta 3, because a two graph is defined to be set of triples with an even number in any four set. So if you put one on those triples and zeros on the other, you're just saying that you sum over any four set, you always get zero. So that's the kernel of delta 3. So all we're saying is that uh, the cohomology of the simplex vanishes in dimensions 0, 1, and 2. So if you like, a two-graph is a two-co-cycle on the simplex uh, with coefficients in F2. And that's why Hickman called them two-graphs, because you know, in, uh, topologists uh, make the dimension one less than perhaps we might like it to be. But, uh, <laughs> so that's why they're two-graphs. So the other thing that I haven't told you about is double covers of complete graphs. So you take a complete graph, and by double cover what I mean is this. Each vertex of the two graph is replaced by two vertices, and each edge of the, two gra of the complete graph is replaced by two edges going, uh, two disjoint edges between those two pairs of vertices. And, uh, uh, well, let me show you the picture first. So here are the two vertices corresponding to one vertex of Kn. Here are the two <coughs> vertices corresponding to another. So the joins can either be like that or like that. Up to isomorphism, it doesn't matter, because if I change the order of two of those vertices, I'll just convert that picture into that picture. But if you pick one out of each pair of vertices, you'll get some of the edges will be there. Suppose I always pick, suppose I draw them as the pairs as vertical, as I've shown here, and uh, always pick the top vertex, then whenever I have a pair like this, I'll see an edge. Whenever I have a pair like this, I'll see a non-edge. So I'll get some graph. When I flip over these two, I turn this into this. That will switch the graph at that vertex. Uh, now, so any, two, any 
two vertices of the complete graph look alike in the double cover up to isomorphism. But for three vertices, there are two possibilities, and here they are. Uh, so there are three pairs. They can either be covered by two triangles or by a hexagon. Uh, so there are two kinds of triples, and uh, that's uh, where the two-graph structure will come in. So the automorphism group of the double cover is itself a double cover of the automorphism group of the two graphs. So it's a group with a center of order two, and the quotient is the automorphism group of the two graph. Uh, may or may not be split. If you take the dodecahedron again, uh, sorry, I had the icosahedron before, same, same group, never mind. Uh, the double cover is just the one skeleton. Uh, you see, we've taken the diagonals, and if you look at two diagonals, you see there are two edges joining two ends of them. The other ends are not joined. So we get a double cover of K6, and uh, the um, automorphism group is uh, C2 cross A5. It's just the uh, group of symmetries of the icosahedron. Uh, so equiangular lines, how do they tie into this picture? Well, uh, suppose we start with a graph, A, and then we form, well, we've had uh, uh, Laplacian matrices already, but this is a slightly different thing. This is the Seidel adjacency matrix. You put uh, zero on the diagonal, plus one for adjacency, and minus one for non-adjacency. So it's just a variant of the usual adjacency matrix. It's a real symmetric matrix, so it's diagonalizable. Its eigenvalues are real, and what is switching in this picture? Well, when you switch, you change edges to non-edges between two sets, so you change ones to minus ones. You can do that by just pre- and post-multiplying A by a diagonal matrix with minus ones in the position of the switching set and plus ones everywhere else. So that will give you a, uh, um, a graph which is um, uh, similar to A, has the same spectrum, so the spectrum of the, the Seidel spectrum, the spectrum of the Seidel adjacency matrix, is a switching class invariant, so a two-graph invariant, if you like. And how do we, uh, okay, so how do we get equiangular lines out of this? Well, A has trace zero, so its smallest eigenvalue must be negative, assuming it's not just the null graph, uh, say minus lambda, uh, and it'll have some multiplicity, and so when you add lambda i on to A, you get a positive semi-definite matrix uh, of rank D. And that matrix is a matrix of inner products of a set of vectors in d-dimensional space. And if you look at those vectors, the inner products, so we've got a matrix with lambda on the diagonal and plus or minus one off the diagonal. That means all the vectors have length uh, square root of lambda and the, the uh, Cosines of the angles between them are uh, 1 over lambda or minus 1 over lambda. So the lines are equiangular. So from a, from a graph, and because this spectrum is invariant under switching, from essentially from a two graph, from a switching class, you get a set of equiangular lines. Switching the graph corresponds to replacing the vectors in the switching set by their negatives. And conversely, given a set of equiangular lines, I described to you already how you go back to the two graph. You take the triples that make acute angles uh, to be the triples of the two graph. So I did a picture for this as well. There are three. Imagine that this is a picture in three dimensions and all those angles are 60 degrees, even if they don't look it. That set of lines is obviously completely different from this set of lines with all the angles 60 degrees. So this is a set making all the angles acute. This is a set where you could, if you chose that vector, that vector, and that vector, make all the angles obtuse. Right. Um, so that's, uh, those are the basic facts about two graphs. And I've told you nothing there that hasn't been known for quite a long time. But now I want to uh, come on to a few new topics related to switching classes and two graphs. Uh, all fairly recent. Uh, better put it over here. So, first we come on to the following problem. Uh, this is a 
problem purely in Euclidean geometry and appears to have nothing to do with graphs at all. But uh, for in two dimensions, Boros and Faraday, barony in, dimension, in arbitrary dimension, this was the problem that they considered. You take a set of points, any old set of points, n points in general position in d-dimensional space. That means no three of them on a line, no four in a plane, so on. No, uh, no d plus one in a hyperplane, right? So that means you choose any d of these, any d plus one of these points, they form a simplex, a d-dimensional simplex, and the claim is there is a point, not necessarily one of the points you were given, there is a point somewhere in the Euclidean space which lies in a fraction at least a constant, this const positive constant, of all of the simplexes that you can choose from those points, right? So think about this in two dimensions. What I'm saying is if you have a plane, you choose n points in general position in the plane, then you look at all the triangles that you can make from those points, so there'll be n choose three triangles, at least a fraction c2 of those, so there is a point that lies in at least a fraction c2 of all of those triangles. So that's the content of the theorem. There is a point that is covered by a positive proportion of all the possible triangles or simplexes in general. And the correct value of C2 is 2 ninths. That's the best possible value. There's always a point that's covered by 2 ninths of all the possible triangles, at least. But there may not be a point that's covered by more than 2 ninths in general. So that's the, uh, that's the uh, theorem. Uh, the question is, what is the, so to speak, correct value of C2? So if you like, the supremum of all real numbers for which the statement is true in arbitrary dimension. So that is the problem. And uh, uh, perhaps slightly surprising, it was uh, Misha Gromov who uh, produced something which gave a breakthrough on this problem. This is a long paper, about 150 pages, and I tried to read it and didn't actually get very far, I have to admit. But uh, uh, Gromov gave a procedure for improving the lower bound on the constant CD. And it's a rather strange business. His improvement on the constant CD involves solving certain problems for 2, 3, 4, all the way up to D, calculating certain lower bounds for certain functions, shoving them all into a formula, and you get a lower bound for the constant CD out at the end. Right? But uh, you there's an exposition of that by Matushek and Wagner, which is probably a better place to start if you want to learn about this. Uh, so as I say, there are d minus 1 functions. There's a uh, function index 2, 1 index 3, and so on all the way up to d. And from the if, you know, if you knew those functions exactly, it would give you exactly the value of cd. But in fact, if you get lower bounds for them, you can get a lower bound for CD. And the point is, you can improve the bounds on CD by just improving any one of those functions, which means if you can improve function number two, for example, then you improve the lower bounds for every single one of these constants, all the way up. So that's an attractive thing to do. And uh, so what is the problem that we have to solve? What is Gromov's phi 2? Well, it's precisely this. You look at... So I'm going to use the term density. Density is the proportion of all possible things that actually occur there. So the density of a graph is the number of edges of the graph divided by n choose 2. And the density of a 2 graph is the number of triples in the 2 graph divided by n choose 3. Right? So the density of a graph or a 2 graph is the proportion of all 2 sets or 3 sets that belong to it. And Gromov's function is the following. Phi 2 of alpha is the limit of the densities of two graphs for which all graphs in the switching class have density at least alpha. And that's a slightly difficult thing to get your hands on. You could turn it around and say the inverse function says, let's suppose that we have a two graph with density at least d, then all the graphs in the switching class uh, well, we have to do it the other way around there. We have to say, what's, you know, what's the worst case of the smallest 
density of a graph in the switching class. But so that's the problem that we have to solve. And uh, uh, Dan Kral and two of his students uh, used the uh, flag algebra method, Rasborov's flag algebra me method, which has been employed with great success in many uh, combinatorial problems, especially hypergraph problems, but it has a role to play in graphs as well. Uh, we're able to find lower bounds for phi 2 and hence for CD for arbitrary D, as I explained. Once you can do it for, um, uh, once you've got information about phi 2, it filters through to all of these constants all the way up. Uh, so in fact, uh, according to Gromov's method, you only need values in the range from 0 to 2 ninths, and they produce this lower bound on phi 2, rather strange looking lower bound. I'm not quite sure uh, what it means, but you see it's of order alpha to the, uh, it's alpha minus uh, a bit, which is alpha to three halves, so it sort of gets worse as alpha increases, but uh, um, they, using this, of course you can't improve the lower bound on C2, we know it's two ninths, but they improved C3 from 0.06 to 0.07, quite a big jump given that the best known upper bound is 0.09, so that's the size of the gap that we still have between uh, lower and upper bounds in three dimensions. It's considerably worse in higher dimensions, and I don't know to what extent anybody has really seriously engaged with uh, finding phi th bounds for phi 3 and phi 4 and so on to uh, do the higher dimensional ones, but this is the current state of play with uh, uh, this constant C3. Right, well, now if you just go back to what Gromov tells us to calculate, uh, so as I said, it's equivalent to finding the smallest number of edges in a graph in the switching class of a two graph with given density, and saying essentially just how bad that can be. Now, what's the how do you recognize the graph in the switching class with the smallest number of edges? Well, if I take a graph and I contemplate switching it with respect to this set, so all the edges from that set to its complement will go to non-edges. Uh, if, as long as there are less than half of the possible crossings are edges, then when I switch, the number will increase. If there were more than half, the number would decrease. So a graph will have smallest density in the switching class if it has the property that for every partition of the vertices into two parts, the number of edges of the graph that cross the partition is at most half of the total number of pairs across the partition. So we're looking for that kind of property of graphs in the switching class. And that sort of suggests that actually there might be more interesting things to find out about switching classes. The switching class is a set of 2 to the power n minus 1 graphs, some of which might be isomorphic, but uh, they'll have varying numbers of edges and varying numbers of triangles and maybe other properties varying. There might be more interesting questions to ask about these things. Distribution of the number of edges in the switching class, uh, how tightly concentrated or otherwise can it be, and stuff like that. And I don't know, there's just a small amount of work on that. I'll just give you one tiny little uh, piece of information. The average edge density in any switching class whatsoever is always a half. And that's because we've got an entire switching class here. So if I look at two vertices and I say, in a random graph in the switching class, what's the probability that those two vertices are joined by an edge? Well, if they're joined by an edge in one graph, then they will be joined by an edge whenever I switch with respect to a set that doesn't separate them. If I switch with respect to a set that does separate them, that'll become a non-edge. So all you need to observe is that the number of sets that don't separate these two and the number of sets that do separate them are equal, and they are. It's 2 to the n minus 1 of both, so that's how this comes out. So uh, the average is always a half but you can still, as I say, go on and ask about variance and numbers of triangles and things like that. So there may be some room for some interesting stuff there. Right, so now I'm coming on to the, uh, the next topic, and I'd hope to have a complete answer to this question by the time of this conference, but 
life has been a bit hectic for me recently and uh, the, what remains to be done is uh, a bit of writing programs and running them and a bit of thinking too because the simple-minded programs uh, you know, the simple-minded approach to it won't quite do the job so I have to uh, uh, think of some clever tricks and I haven't had time to do that so I'll tell you a theorem and the theorem will say there are a finite number of exceptions and I believe it shouldn't be too big a job and when I get a bit of spare time I should be able to work out what all the finite number of exceptions are but I can't tell you now I was hoping that I would be able to give you a complete answer to this question so uh, some generalities about uh, primitive permutation groups so permutation group is primitive if there's no partition of the underlying set invariant under the group except for the two trivial ones that must be invariant, the partition with a single part and the partition into parts of size 1. Every group preserves those two partitions. If there are no other invariant partitions, I call the group primitive. And I say a set of more than two points. I need to make that exception with the way I've done this because if you have a set of two points, there are only two partitions on this set, namely the two trivial ones. So any group will fail to preserve any non-trivial partition because there isn't one to preserve. And uh, I don't want uh, to worry about the question about whether the trivial group on two points is primitive or not. That's actually a very important question. If you've ever gone carefully through the proof of the Onan-Scott theorem, you will see that the reason why uh, diagonal groups come up is exactly this. A certain group has to act on a certain set uh, preserving no non-trivial partitions but it might be the trivial group on two points and that allows uh, various diagonal groups and eventually twisted reef products to come in so it's a, it's a very deep fact that I've just uh, told you there the fact that uh, the trivial group on uh, two points has no non-trivial invariant partitions but back to the business um, since the classification of finite simple groups, which it's very difficult for any human being to say, yes, it's definitely finished, but uh, I do believe it is definitely finished now. Uh, uh, it was thought to be nearly finished back in 1980, and everybody immediately started saying, well, let's assume it's right, what can we do with it? One of the first things we realized was that uh, it would tell us a huge amount about primitive groups. And in particular, what it would tell us is that primitive groups, apart from the symmetric and alternating groups, are very small. And uh, there are bounds uh, of about n to the power square root of n. And if you're prepared to say, well, let's allow a few exceptions, you can get it down to n to the power log n. If you're prepared to allow a few more exceptions, you can get it down to n to the log log n. And if you are really only interested in almost simple groups, you can get it down to n to the constant. So primitive groups are tiny. That's what we've learned from the classification. For permutation group theorists, I think that's the most important thing that we have learned from the classification of finite simple groups. Primitive groups are very small. And I'm going to just follow one train of thought to illustrate this idea that primitive groups are small. So the results coming up depend essentially on the classification for this idea that primitive groups are small. And uh, it leads on to uh, the next result that I wanted to tell you about two graphs. Right, so here's a theorem I proved with Peter Neumann and Jan Saxel back in the early 1980s. This was, uh, you know, one of the first things using the, this uh, new at the time idea that primitive groups are small. So if you take a primitive group on a set of size n, not the symmetric or alternating group, and also excluding finitely many other exceptions, then there's a subset of x whose setwise stabilizer in G is the identity. So that uh, you might expect that if you take a reasonably nice rich group acting on x, then 
every subset would be moved by some, ele some non-identity element of the group. Well, it isn't so. There's a subset whose setwise stabilizer is the identity. No element of the group fixes that as a set. And as I say, you have to exclude Sn and An because it's obviously false for those. You also have to exclude finitely many exceptions. And we in our paper just said finitely many exceptions. And perhaps that was a good thing because it, uh, uh, there are several different ways that you can actually take that. And uh, uh, so here are some extensions of our result. Um, so most importantly, I suppose, Arkash Seresh found that uh, he could classify all the exceptions. And it's an interesting list. There are 43 exceptional groups here. So 43 primitive groups other than symmetric and alternating groups, which have no, uh, there's no uh, subset of the domain whose pointwise stabilizer is the identity. I'll show you his list in a moment, but the largest one has degree 32. I showed that, uh, in fact, you can quantify it in a different way. If you say, look at the proportion of subsets whose stabilizer is trivial, so the proportion of all the sets in the power set which are fixed only by the identity, that proportion tends to 1 as n goes to infinity if you go up in a sequence of primitive groups not including Sn and An, for which it would obviously be false. But for primitive groups other than Sn or An, uh, there is uh, uh, the proportion of, if you like, the proportion of sets whose setwise stabilizer is not the identity goes to 0 and goes to zero at a reasonably uh, not too slow rate. Lotzi Babai and I showed that uh, we can take the size of the subset to be at most n to the power a half plus a little bit. And I want to uh, say a little bit about this. Uh, Lotzi isn't here yet, but Misha is here. And Misha was the, uh, uh, the driving force behind this. This was. Uh, I'm embarrassed to say, in 1990, in Kyoto, just before the um, ICM, we were at a, a, a graph theory conference in Hakone, a place with uh, uh, volcanic hot springs and nice stuff like that. But um, so Misha asked this question, and Lutzi and I set to work on it. And we managed to prove something which I'll tell you about in a moment. But never quite, Lutzi and I have history in this respect. We've, there are several results that we've proved that uh, either never appeared or only appeared many, many years later. Uh, uh, but in this case, uh, we had a result. Uh, we had three quarters there in place of a half. And uh, a half is best possible. And I was quite happy to go with three quarters because I thought the job of reducing three quarters to a half would be a bit of a nightmare. But Lutzi said, no, we should hang on and we should uh, push that down to a half. And so, of course, the result was we both got busy and went off and did other things. And uh, eventually, he came back to it and he managed to uh, uh, get the correct value there. Uh, so n to the half plus little o of 1 is there is a set of that size, so only a little bit bigger than the square root of n, whose setwise stabilizer is the identity. I'll show you why that's best possible in a moment. But anyway, uh, that's another quantification of the original result. But first of all, here is uh, Akash's list of primitive groups with no regular orbit on the power set, so no set whose uh, stabilizer in the primitive group is set by stabilizer is the identity. Uh, so I'll give you a list of triples. Firstly, the degree, the number of points being permuted. Second entry is the number of the group in the gap library of primitive groups. The third is some kind of not necessarily complete description of the primitive group. So here's the list. Starting off with the dihedral group of order 10, acting on five points which you can easily verify for yourself because the stabilizer of a point obviously has order two. The stabilizer of a two set, whether it's an edge or a non-edge of the pentagon, you can easily see there's a reflection that fixes it. So uh, that's also an example. Uh, 
And the last one is the, the full affine group of dimension 5 over the field of uh, two elements acting on 32 points. So that's, the, that's uh, Arkosh's list of 43 primitive groups. Uh, so what Lutzi and I were really doing, and this was actually Misha's question, uh, every group is the automorphism group of a graph. I mentioned this before and showed you a, a strengthening of it. But not every permutation group is the automorphism group of a graph. For example, if the group is doubly transitive and it's not the symmetric group, if a group is doubly transitive, the only G invariant graph, graphs are the complete and null graph, their full automorphism groups are both the symmetric group. So there are many examples of groups, the permutation groups that are not uh, automorphism groups of graphs. So uh, what about hypergraphs? And this is our theorem. So this is the theorem that was already proved in 1990 and has just finally got around to being put on the archive uh, this year, only a month or so ago. Uh, apart from the alternating groups and finitely many others, every primitive group is the full automorphism group of a hypergraph, not only a hypergraph, an edge transitive hypergraph. And the proof strategy for that is you take one of these sets whose sta set-wise stabilizer in the group is the identity. That's an edge of your hypergraph, and you take the, the other edges to be just an orbit of that. You have to do a little bit of work to show that you couldn't have an overgroup of your given primitive group, which uh, leaves that hypergraph invariant. Uh, and that's where some of these estimates come in. But there's the theorem, and there is, it says finitely many others, so there's a job for somebody, which I think neither Lutzi or I are really uh, going to do in the near future, so if anybody else wants to do it, I would be delighted to uh, uh, encourage you. Uh, find the full list, because, you know, this looks like a nice theorem, uh, and if we had the full list of exceptions, it would be an even nicer theorem, so there's a job there to be done. Uh, so as I say, the problem is to find a finite list of exceptions. And it follows from that other little bit that the reason why the paper hung fire for so long is that you can take the size of the edges in the hypergraph to be just, to be this n to the one-half plus O of one, because you can find a set of that size with uh, only the uh, Id uh, identity stabilizing it. Uh, oh, I was going to show you why that's essentially best possible. Okay, it's essentially best possible for the following reason. Uh, Take the alternating group, not in its regular, it's not, it's not in its usual action, but in its action on the set of two element subsets of the set that you began with. Uh, so what do we need? What is, so what would a hypergraph be preserved by that? Well, an edge of the hypergraph would be a set of pairs from the underlying N set. So it would be a set of edges of a graph. And this graph would have to have the property that all its automorphisms are even permutations. If you have fewer than about square root of n, you either have a disjoint edge that can be flipped by a transposition, or you have two vertices that are not covered by edges, which are also can be flipped by a transposition. I said square root of n. I meant n is now uh, m choose 2, where m is the degree of the alternating group. So that's a primitive group on m choose two points where you need at least about m minus one edges in a graph if its automorphism <coughs> group is going to be contained in the alternating group. So uh, anyway, uh, that's why n to the half is best possible there, essentially. So here's a new theorem along these lines. And as I say, we might have thought before the classification that... Uh, if you wanted to say, I've got a very symmetric switching class of graphs here, you might say, what I mean by that is that its automorphism group is primitive. Uh, and you might think that uh, very symmetric switching classes should be made up of at least fairly symmetric graphs. Well, it isn't so. Apart from the switching classes of the complete and null graphs and finitely many others, every switching class with primitive automorphism group contains a graph with trivial automorphism group. So 
This goes a little bit beyond the results I've told you, but the techniques used to prove those results do apply here with a little twist. And so some computation uh, along the lines of what Akash did, uh, but with a bit of a twist, should be enough to show that, um, uh, to actually work out what the finitely many others are. There are some, but uh, I suspect less than 43. Anyway, so uh, uh, work to determine the finitely many exceptions, I hopefully said, is in progress, and I do hope to get back to this at some point, but uh, if anybody else really wants, is in a hurry to know the answer and wants to do the computations themselves, it's fine by me. Right, so in the last bit of the talk, I'll tell you about something else related to switching classes that uh, has come up fairly recently, and this is... Uh, work by uh, Robert Bailey and some of his uh, collaborators on metric dimension of graphs. Uh, so they were talking about metric dimension. I'm going to define something, I'm not going to define metric dimension for you. I'll, I might say what it is, but uh, I'm interested in uh, something more closely tied into the graphs and the two graphs that we're dealing with. So basically the idea is, you have a graph or some kind of structure, maybe a metric space or something, you want some sort of a basis for it, which is a set of points uh, which, if you know those points and you know the relation of everything else to those points, then everything is uniquely determined by those relations. So suppose you have a metric space, if you have d points in that metric space with the property that any point, any two points outside are differentiated by the ordered list of their distances to the d points in the basis. And the minimum d for which that holds is the metric dimension. So that's the kind of game we're playing. We're trying to pin down the whole structure by a relatively small set, such that the relations of things outside to points in the set uniquely define the points outside. So that's the general plan, okay? Everyone happy with that? Right, so I will say a graph basis for a graph is a set of vertices with the property that distinct vertices outside S have distinct neighbor sets in S. So if I know this set of vertices, two points outside cannot have the same neighbors within S, so they're uniquely identified by their neighborhoods within the set S. Uh, so I'll call that the graph dimension. And if the graph has diameter 2, so the only distances are 1 and 2, this is exactly the same as metric dimension because d distance 1 means joined and distance 2 means not joined. So there is a relation between this and metric dimension. Uh, so a graph basis is a base for the automorphism group in the sense that its pointwise stabilizer is trivial because if you fix all the points in a base, everything else is uniquely specified by its relations to the base, so everything else will be fixed. So the, stable, the pointwise stabilizer of a, base, uh, a, metric, a graph basis is a base for the automorphism group. And so there is a connection between this kind of basis and a base for the automorphism group. Now for hypergraphs, it's a little more complicated, but the basic idea is exactly the same. Suppose we have, so I'll use hypergraph terminology briefly, a three-uniform hypergraph. That means we have a set of vertices, and the edges are three element sets, right? Now, when I take my set that I want to be a basis, I've got to say, take a point outside. What is it, how do I define its relationship to this basis? How do I sort of shadow it on the basis? And the answer is, I look at all the pairs in the basis that together with that point outside make a three set in the, uh, an edge of the hypergraph. So I take, uh, I look at the set S, I put on it a graph, for each point outside I put on a graph whose edges are the pairs in S which make up a triple of the hypergraph with V. And what I require is that all those graphs should be different, right, for all the points V outside. And then the same things that I said here will also apply for uh, hypergraph bases for three uniform hypergraphs. So now I have to uh, say a little bit about um, 
things that some of you, I think, are much more interested in than general, hypergra uh, general two graphs, namely regular two graphs and strongly regular graphs and stuff like that. Uh, if you have a two graph with a vertex V, there is a unique graph in the corresponding switching class which has V as an isolated vertex. So here's an example. What I do is I take this. This is the switching class associated with the... Um, uh, with the icosahedron, right? So there are, uh, there's one more, but here is the guy, this vertex is isolated here. And if I took one of the others and I wanted to make this vertex the isolated vertex, what would I have to do? Well, I have to disconnect it from all its neighbors. So I switch with respect to the set of neighbors. And what will that do? That will mean that that edge goes, those two edges go, but these two edges get put in, and I'll get a pentagon with an isolated vertex. So there's a unique graph like that. Uh, and these graphs are called the descendants of the two graph. So and another way of looking at them is, you see, that is exactly, well, sorry, this is the picture you would get by <coughs> taking the icosahedron and looking down a diagonal. But if you were to instead look at the top point and the neighbors of the bottom point, you would see this guy here. So you can find this in the skeleton of the icosahedron, which is the double cover of the complete graph associated to the two graph. What you do is say, OK, uh, I will uh, arrange, remember to get a graph in the switching class, I take one out of each pair. So I take the one that I want to be isolated, and I just make sure that I avoid, uh, I, I, I pick out of each other point, I pick the one that isn't joined to it, then it'll be isolated. So if two descendants are isomorphic, then the corresponding vertices are in the same orbit of the automorphism group, because you can reconstruct the original two graph. It's a set of odd triples in the graph. And so if all descendants are isomorphic, the automorphism group is transitive, and conversely. Uh, now, uh, an important class of two graphs, and certainly the ones that motivated Higman and to a large extent Seidel in the early days, were what we, they call regular two graphs, where any two vertices lie in the same number of triples. And we can rephrase that in several ways. Uh, the two graph is regular, if and only if. The corresponding double cover is what's now become called a Taylor graph, after Don Taylor, who wrote his thesis about two graphs. Uh, he was the person whose discussions with me got me that first postdoc, so I owe something to him as well. So. What is a Taylor graph? It's an antipodal distance regular graph with diameter 3 antipodal classes of size 2. So it's a distance regular graph, if you know what that means, where you start with the vertex, there's a first layer, second layer, third layer just consists of a single vertex. right? And that should be distance regular. I mean, you can always get that, but because this, is, this graph is just the double cover coming from T, but I want it to be distance regular. Some or equivalently every descendant of T is strongly regular with k equal to 2 mu. These are the strongly regular graph parameters. k is the valency, mu is the number of common neighbors of two non-adjacent points. So the pentagon is a strongly regular graph, valency 2, two non-adjacent points have one common neighbor, so mu is 1, so that works. And the Seidel spectrum has, contains just two distinct eigenvalues. There's a positive and a negative eigenvalue. So those are the regular two graphs. And uh, so uh, the descendants, if you take the, the icosahedron two graph, the descendants are pentagons, as I showed you. The descendants of the Higman two graph are the McLaughlin strongly regular graph, the one that McLaughlin used to construct his simple group. Uh, so Robert Bailey showed that the metric dimension of the descendants of any Taylor graph differ by at most one. So metric dimension, these are all they're, they're all strongly regular graphs, so metric dimension and graph dimension are the same in that case. Right, so he, s he stated it as a theorem about metric dimension, but I could equivalently say graph dimension. Well, this is what I was able to prove. The graph dimension of any graph in the switching class of a two graph does not exceed the hypergraph dimension. So the graph dimension of any graph in the switching class is less than or equal to the hypergraph dimension of the two graph. And conversely, if you take a, this, this is for any graph in the switching class. This one only refers to the descendants, the graphs that you get by isolating a vertex. 
Uh, if V is a vertex of the two graph, the hypergraph dimension of T is at most one more than the graph dimension of the descendant. At most one more. So you see how Robert Bailey's result follows from these two, because if you specialize to the case where uh, the uh, two graph is regular, then these descendants are strongly regular, so metric dimension is the same as uh, graph dimension. And you see from here that uh, the descendants have the metric dimension of a descendant is either the hypergraph dimension of the two graph or one less, so they can differ by at most one. So, uh, but you see, there is a bit of a gap here. This result applies to the whole switching class. This result only applies to those particular graphs that happen to be to have isolated vertices. So uh, I don't quite know how to fill that gap, but I think uh, that's about all I have for you. So thank you very much. Yeah. The reason why I posed this question a long time ago in Hakone was quite simple because I was relying to lecture notes by Andrew Simmons, a very simple lemma which is saying that if permutation group has space of size k, then it is k plus one closed. And I wanted to find some less trivial analog of this lemma which has been called to Sesta lemma. And I believe that something. Uh, thanks for that comment, Michelle. Uh, yes. Bill. Uh, perhaps you won't regret this, but there's a, the, a theorem of the sort. Uh, every every permutation group uh, is the automorphism group of a two graph. Let's say a permutation group is not too homogeneous. Uh, no, that's not going to be true. That's not going to be true because uh, you see, as I say, if you take the alternating group acting on two sets, that's not the full automorphism group of any hypergraph where the edge size is less than about the square root of n, a uh, square root of the number of points. So three is certainly not going to be enough in general. Uh, not for not for as permutation groups, no, no. But as I say, they're universal in that other sense that I gave, that they represent a group in all its subgroups. So I think you know we've got to be content with that because we're not going to get the other one. Yes. Is there some estimation for constant? A half plus O of one. Uh, so you want an estimate? Oh. You want an estimate oh. for the little O of one? Some constant. Uh, no, 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 no. It's that just means uh, that the difference between the true exponent and one half goes to zero as n goes to infinity. So O of one is just a function that tends to zero as n goes to infinity, and. I believe you could extract a bound for that function from Lutzi's and my proof. Uh, I'm not quite sure what it would be. It's a uniform bound. It's a uniform bound. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't quite hear the question. Is there a sensible Ramsey type result about no, that? Ah. Indeed. Yes, yes, it does. But okay, so. Um, I don't, the first answer is I don't know. Second answer is it's not going to be completely straightforward because you see we've got triangles, we've got some triangles cover a point and some don't. And those are two very different things, unlike just two different colors of edges in a, in a graph. So, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. It may well be, I don't know, I think. Uh, I, don't know, I don't even know whether anybody looked at that, not to my knowledge.
I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Well, uh, maybe by the end of this week we'll know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, unfortunately, there will come a time when nobody will be able to honk anymore. That's At least we think. You, you know that um, uh, in 1980, when the cl uh, imminent completion of the classification was announced by George Glauberman, John Conway said, right, if you found a new simple group, keep it in your desk drawer for a couple of years until the classification proof comes out, and then publish it. Uh, <laughs> Well, of course, it would have been more than a couple of years in the event, but uh, nobody has come out with another sporadic group. But there's a, there's a blog by two computer scientists, Ken Reagan and... Uh, uh, what's the other guy's name? Steve Lipton or something like that? I can't remember. Uh, they, every year they have predictions for ten mathematical developments that are going to happen in the next year. And one of their predictions for the year 2013 was that a new sporadic simple group would be discovered. <laughs> well, it didn't happen. <laughs> Steve Lin Linton. Steve Linton. No, no, not Steve Linton. No, this is... His last name is Lipton, I'm sure of that. I just don't remember his first name. Sorry? Yes, Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech. Uh, anyway, uh, it's called... Uh, uh, Girdle's last letter in P equals NP, and they really have some interesting things to say, both about computer science and about mathematics. 